Good evening, everybody. Good evening. It's such a lovely night. Uh, welcome to the 2021 Watershed Congress. This is, if I was taking day two uh, of our virtual Watershed Congress week. So we are happy that you are joining us today. The Watershed Congress this year is organized by the Delaware River Network in a collaboration with many, many other organizations. My name is Joey. And I am currently one of the committee planning members here with us today. Before I jump any further, again, I want to welcome you to the justice, inclusion, and difficult conversations in the environmental field. So for the session, uh, which is going to be a panel, we'll be taking questions throughout the entire session. So feel free to be a part of the conversation. Uh, and keyword conversation. We are doing this collectively and together as a group. We are not just you know, sit in and chat with us and just listen to us. Uh, we remind everybody that we are super excited to be here, but we're not experts. We just talk about our experiences in our day to day. Um, and really, again, wants to have the conversation along our colleagues and other members here today. All right. So introducing my first uh, panelist, this is Tarsha Scoven. Uh, Tarsha Scoven started and spearheads an organization called Let's Go Outdoors, uh, a, a leading organization that connects city communities to outdoor experiences. Uh, with vision and commitment to see more people of color experiencing nature. So I would like to take a minute and pass it over to Tarsha to talk a little bit more about her work and what she does. Yeah, hi everybody. I'm so excited to be here with my fellow panelists and all of you. And I always like to say, because we are in a virtual world and we are in a conversation where we are talking about those that aren't normally or aren't directly included sometimes, that I love to call out and shout out because we see you, we know you're here. So we see you 267 with the end numbers 196. We see you Autumn, Carol, David, Diana, Jessica, Joan, Kelsey, Mandy, Michelle, Peter, Raymond, Sarah, Soraya, Samantha, and Tally. We see you and we hope that you are going to engage with us today. So again, I'm with Let's Go Outdoors. We are located and work primarily in the city of Philadelphia. And we really are, um, we grassroots it. We've been uh, in service for about 10 years now. And we work with kindergarten, or I should say kids, youth, zero birth to adults. We're really trying to make sure that all people, especially people of color have access and are able to experience the outdoors. And that can be in the most basic form of doing an outdoor activity like kiting all the way to actually environmental education, where we are learning about our watersheds, where we are learning about birding, tree identification, and things of that sort. But that is really what we're about and really focusing on diverse audiences, of course, welcoming to all. Thanks. That's amazing, Tarsha. And I'm looking forward to really getting a chance to dive in deeper in our conversation, talk a little bit about, a uh, little bit more about what's going on and what you do and really just uh, your organization. So the next person I want to introduce is Hoda Louis. Uh, so Hoda Louis was born in New York City and raised in the Bronx. Um, and as a first generation Latino, he both served in the military and became the first in his family to graduate from college. Uh, he has many, many years of staff management and program development and really has a passion for connecting communities with outdoors. Uh, so I want to go ahead and pass that over to Hoda Louis so he can continue and talk a little bit more about uh, himself. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. It's really great to have the opportunity um, uh, to connect with you all on this, uh, you know, really important topic. Um, but absolutely, the love for the outdoors, uh, you know, having served in the military and also uh, participated in uh, rowing programs in the past. Um, yeah, my connection to uh, nature and the water is, is, is really close to my heart. Um, and so I'm a New York State licensed social worker and I work with families, uh, children, adolescents uh, for about 10 years now. Um, so helping individuals, you know, uh, get connected to services and have access to mental health uh, support. Um, and a big part of that role is trying to connect them to resources and environments that are healing. And um, so nature, uh, the water, Green spaces plays a huge role in that. Um, and I think many of us can agree that when we, we are in those environments, um, it feels great, you know? And so we're trying to see today and how we can 
uh, continue to increase access to communities who may not have the opportunity um, to really take advantage of these uh, green and water spaces, uh, and particularly in the communities that I work in, in all the five boroughs in New York City. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm honored to be here and I really look forward to having uh, a really wonderful conversation with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. I really appreciate that. And I think you jumped, you got us started right into the conversation. Uh, before I dive any deeper, I really wanna just take a minute and just highlight uh, the title again. It's really looking at justice inclusion and how we think about difficult conversations. And I wanted to bring clarity to that piece of it, right? Difficult conversations. Um, a lot of times we see that um, and we think like, oh, well, we can't have this or it just puts on this like invisible layer of like, it's a difficult conversation. Is it something that's very touchy? Do we not say certain words? And the reality is, is just bring it to light what many people just haven't felt comfortable talking about beforehand. It doesn't have to have a negative connotation. Um, and I think this session, it really is just talking about bringing everybody outdoors and getting, you know, allowing the opportunity to connect them with open spaces, um, thinking about ways to engage them and really just get them excited uh, and learning about the resources that are many of them in their backyard. I, you know, I live in North Camden and growing up, I didn't necessarily have the opportunity. I didn't go outside as much, right? Outside was going and playing out front of my house. So they couldn't go too far. So that's like the parking lot and the playground or in, you know, the curbside. Uh, but there is, you know, we have the Delaware River back channel. We have many open parks here and many of those I didn't use as a kid. And it's not because, um, not because, you know, I was scared of them. I just didn't know about them. I didn't know how to use it. I didn't know what that was. Um, and so fast forward to this weekend, I was out in Mount Tammany up at the Delaware River Gap hiking. And so it's just incredible to learn how outdoors was kind of like this disconnect and then over time you learn how to to find that connection and passion for it so hopefully this conversation allows us to talk a little bit about those experiences and jump into that so it's a difficult conversation but we knock the difficult part about it we just talk we just join and so again i invite all of our panelists and all of our attendees to jump in the conversation and be a part of it so i really just wanted to to again move into our first question uh, for our panelists to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and justice, and what that looks like. Uh, because we all know that everybody has a different perspective on that. Everybody sees it differently. There's no one view. Um, and so we would like to know and, and ask that you talk about how does this present itself in your work and in your day to day um, overall. So I'm going to go ahead and toss it to Tarsha if she can start us off. Yeah, sure. So so this DEIJ. So I'm going to start off with a little um, what is it? Something that happened to me, and and it may happen to all of you or um, those of you who are watching. Just think about this. This now we work on a lot of grants, and we talk with multiple individuals. And I happened to be talking with a, a person who was like at a director level, and one of the grants had questions in regards to DE DEI. And um, so I was being the person that was going to be like writing it. I was kind of taking the lead. And so when I went to this individual and I said, do you want me to take on the DEI questions? And this individual was a Caucasian, identifies as that. And the response was, what's DEI? And me, I'm like all of a sudden furious, right? In my own mind, again, this did not happen out, out loud. I didn't say anything, but you know, I took it as what, how can you not know? We got Black Lives Matter going on. We have multiple things that are happening in our country, our world right now. How, how could you not know? But at the same time, I, I didn't go there, but it instilled in me in this moment, like not even everybody knows what DEI or DEIJ however we're phrasing it, what that even means. So I think from one perspective, we have to take a step back because I also look at, you know, how did I even learn what it meant? And, you know, being in the whole environmental field and, and you know, thinking about watersheds and, 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 and equity for water. So it's like, okay, I had to remember, I didn't even know what it meant until it started becoming this label, I guess. So therefore I wanted us all to just, you know, step back for a moment because some people may not know and then we have to think back, well, how do we even know what that meant too? And my perspective is 
making sure that me as a person of color, because I know, you know, one look at me, you can tell I'm of some diverse <laughs> um, racial background. So I think it's showing up at the table. Um, and I have to say, it doesn't matter. We are all diverse. So we all have to show up at the table. But if we put it in context, my perspective is at least being here for the conversation, whether that's going to, you know, be educating somebody else, sharing from another perspective, or me being the person that's going to share my personal story. And then the other piece that Joey is, is putting out there is, you know, how does it play a role in the work that we're doing with Let's Go Outdoors in general? I mean, from day one, our mission started with really connecting city communities, especially people of color. So we, 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 that is at our core. So just knowing that we are bringing a diverse audience into spaces, we know that we're, we're changing that equality, I guess, or building on equitable, because if we weren't there in the first place, we wouldn't have movement towards it. So that's how our organization plays a role. And then that's kind of where I come from on the perspective of, you know, what do I, how did I learn about it and what do other people know? So thanks. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Tasha. I really appreciate that. Um, and you, you, you mentioned it, right? It's about bringing our stories to the table and using that as our kind of like a guiding site. So, uh, hold Louis, I'm going to pass it to you. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I Tarsha uh, really made, um, she made some great points and there's two that I'd, I'd wanna, I'd love to build on some more on. Um, and one is, so the point made of, you know, understanding like what, what DEIJ actually is, right? So in the time of, you know, social media and hashtags and trends, um, there's a lot of misunderstandings about what diversity is, what equity is, and how that inclusion looks like in our workspaces or in our circles. Um, and so one thing I, I think it's, uh, it's really important to um, really be aware of is that um, some of feeling comfortable to really ask, to really ask the questions in order to be informed um, about the topic and, and to not, uh, you know, feel, uh, uh, scared to ask those questions. And so the space that we have here today is really meant for that. Um, and also that, um, oftentimes, and from a social work perspective and, and you know, discussing like feelings and emotions, and trust me, a lot, many of us are very uncomfortable talking about feelings and it's like, you know, I don't cry. I work out. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, um, but we all have feelings. And, and so some of the initial feelings is saying, wait, am I being judged because I may not understand something? Or is there something that maybe I've been uh, practicing or engaging in um, that actually there is a better approach as to how to go around that? Um, so as, uh, one of the key things is to really kind of drop our defenses and really uh, have all of us kind of be um, in a space where we can really have those difficult conversations and have a genu genuine um, dialogue amongst ourselves and with everyone participating here tonight. Um, and uh, one, 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 I guess one catalyst that maybe we can, we, I, I'd like to start with is um, the, the statement of, well, this conversation of, of race and e equality is so divisive. Why do we have to focus on, on race and color, right? Um, and so there's the perception that uh, not talking about this is actually inclusive. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that often folks um, kind of get a little defensive about and saying, well, I don't see color. Um, and so the, the act of not seeing color actually supports the divisiveness because there's really no way that we can't see color. Um, we all have different characteristics and diversity goes way beyond color. Uh, you know, there's uh, backgrounds of how we grew up, there's education, uh, there's faith, there's uh, our professional backgrounds. So even diversity in how we work in our roles, in our professions, 
and diverse, the uh, diversity of thought um, plays a big role in this in this conversation. So it's 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 a it's it's a much more complex um, than we really think, and that it's per perceived in the in the social media or in or in the media. And so um, yeah, I think we can dive into uh, some of that tonight. That's awesome, and 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 you both touched up on on some really great points that I think, like you said, Holui, we will dive into in just a moment. Um, I really want to just take, you know, you and I, all three of us had the chance to chat beforehand, and we got into this conversation about this, these un, the invisible barriers that sometimes don't get brought up, or just barriers in general to getting um, diverse communities outdoors. Um, but this is not a new conversation. We've had this conversation for quite some time. Um, so I want to kind of just pick your brain a little bit to see where do you think some of these barriers um, kind of still exist and what, how do they kind of present themselves till to the day, even after having the conversation for, for a little bit of time? Yeah, um, so regarding barriers, I think, um, so specific to, to, to the work that, that we're uh, doing now, I think uh, there's twofold. So one is um, how do we present activity in nature and in the, and, and the environment, right? Whether it's how, we, how the, uh, the marketing um, is portrayed and, um, and how uh, some of the activities and even the, the gear and equipment to, to be able to practice these activities, how all of that is presented. Um, and another aspect is organizationally, um, how, uh, how, do our, how diverse are our organizations um, and the folks that have the ability to make decisions and have influence in the environment. Um, I, I think one thing to consider uh, is that, you know, social norms. So if we have a personal social circle, uh, whether it's, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, professional or not, depending on how that looks, is how, who we end up naturally tapping onto for certain roles and for recruitment, like let's say for HR, right? So we, 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 HR highly depends on our, on our networks. Um, and so, so some of those things really tie into that. And so the conversation of, well, you know, we hire and we recruit uh, in a diverse and equitable manner, yet um, we still see the challenges of what that looks like, whether it's uh, frontline staff or management or executive staff. And we can see those changes along the lines, right? Um, and, and oftentimes it's assumed that the diversity of hiring is, is, is all there is to it. Um, and, and there is more to that as well as how the policies play in role, the acceptance to how the work, work culture is. Um, and one key metric of whether or not your DEI efforts are, uh, are uh, effective within your workspaces or, or, or your networks is retention. So there may be the opportunity to engage and hire individuals but if the environment isn't staying true to the DEI efforts or the model that's being implemented, uh, you won't be able to retain those folks. And that's, that's a key metric to really consider. Um, I'll make a little comment on that. <laughs> so there was a lot in there. And one of the key things too that or Louis was um, building upon is kind of that social piece and also the education piece. And when we think about how Joey's asking about what are those barriers? And I will let you know, I am on a few boards and one of the big things, and one of, one of them is local here near me. And it is where the board is pretty much all white other than myself, which is cool. Right. We got to accept like we understand we know the numbers and things like that. So it's all cool. But at the same time. We have to recognize when when I'm on that board, you know, the social circles that we all have, we connect with those that look like us. I mean, that's so, that's that social by nature, just components. I mean, I took sociology in college, so we could go into a whole lesson on that. But at the same time, 
recognized, you know, and, and that's okay. And we have to be okay accepting that that's where it is. And when I was talking about the individual about, oh, do you know what DEI is? You know, I don't know if she even has, you know, people of color in, in that circle, in her circle. So sometimes that's what it is. But one of those barriers, number one, um, when the board isn't diverse and then connecting externally, like how does a board say, all right, we want support for our organization, but recognize we don't know anybody that doesn't look like us <laughs> to actually move out into the community. And a lot of organizations, one of the barriers that we face a lot as well is that the organizations um, can't operate externally because of staffing shortages or not having partnerships. So I think that that's another way that, you know, when we're talking about equity, diversity, inclusion, one, we had to take a hard look inside of our board and who we look like and who we're communicating with and then saying, okay, let's find the right partner. Sometimes it does take a risk and it may not work out the way you want it to, or it just might, but that's one of those things that we find that we, we struggle with as our, our organization. Um, and, you know, as we try and bring more people of color outdoor to outdoor spaces too. And, you know, of course, getting there is always a barrier sometimes. Um, but those are some key things that I wanted to point out. So ask questions if you have them and I can expand on that a little bit too. I know our conversation is short today. Uh, so anyway, that's what I wanted to add. No, oh, that's awesome. Thank you, Tasha and Um, I think I think one of the common themes that we really harp on and and it's one that's been here from the beginning and has continued to present itself is this idea of systems, right? And that they're still in place and working to, to navigate them and identify them and highlight them and you know, figuring out where 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 the next best moves kind of fit in to, to continue to make you know progress, right? This is not an end-all goal. Um, it's there's no finish line. It's a continuum, and it's a, it's a moving forward process, right? Um, so I think I think that that's an important thing that um that you all mentioned, and you're all getting you're getting kudos already from the the chat. Uh, and you know, again, the idea of bringing everything to the forefront is the most important part of the conversation. So uh, we do have uh, some questions that are popping in, and I do want to um, I want to start with our first one here. Um, and just to give you a little bit of context, it says that our BIPOC and BIPOC stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, uh, and LGBTQ plus professionals of color, they tend to have to shoulder or individuals have to shoulder uh, this emotional labor or this you know, responsibility um, at their organization and then kind of act, work as a trailblazer uh, in DEIA initiatives um, and workplace accountability. So with that kind of in mind, you know, this individual is interested in talking about how do you think about how wider or cis hetero professionals can take initiatives um, to alleviate this burden without certain, you know, centering themselves out. Um, and then the second part of that is really looking into how do you think um, BIPOC or LGBT professionals uh, can set clear boundaries while still creating real change um, for you all. Um, yeah, so, uh, so the emotional, the, the emotional labor, uh, I've been a part of, of several, uh, DEIJ implementations organizationally, and I can tell you that, um, the majority of the time, uh, many decision makers of the executives who, who are trying to implement this, they really don't fully understand understand it um, and the work that it takes to, to really put this into place. Um, th these, these are, it's a cultural change and cultural change in any organization, regardless of what you're focusing on, it takes time and it has to be done at all levels and everyone needs to buy into it. So it's not something that, you know, just some supervisors or some managers take a lead on as a, uh, like as a project, this is a complete all hands in, um, as Tarsha mentioned about, you know, from the board down, everyone has to be a part of this. Um, and if they are not, then what ends up happening is that 
um, the folks that are, are shouldering the burden or that labor of emotion um, are, 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 are swimming upstream. So they're hearing two things. One is, hey, we want to be supportive, but at the same time, when it's uh, uh, when the work is being put in to really implement it, um, no one has time to sit in in the meetings. Um, when we walk away from the meetings, there's there's homework that needs to be done, right? There should be things that should be discussed amongst different groups, but that never happens. And then so the conversation ends up at the next DEIJ meeting. And then the progress is super slow and you, you're just going around in circles and not really making any, 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 taking any steps forward. And what then the result of that is the momentum and the inspiration to try to get this off the ground starts to fizzle out. And then there's burnout. And then it kind of falls to the back burner. Um, and, and then what, unfortunately, some of the, the, the consequences to that is that now you, there a, a, an emotional uh, vulnerability has been opened up amongst the staff. And then now there's this like, almost like a wound that now needs to heal. Um, and so folks then are in a position where they need to decide whether they're going to continue within the organization or they need to move on. Um, and so that's a really tough place to be in. And then there, there it creates a, a tension and I've seen it where then you have the split between the white employees and, and, and the, the BIPOC community and LGBT, LGBTQ plus community as well. Um, and it's an us versus them almost. And it's, it's, you would never think that that would really come into play or you could visually see it. The lunch breaks, who sits next to who, the talking, uh, oh, did you hear so-and-so like get angry about something? Why are they so sensitive? You know, there's all these things that come up. So um, it takes a lot of work um, and then a lot of vulnerability from every single level of an organization. All right, just jumping on what Jorge Luis is saying, it takes time and, 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 and there's no right answers yet. I think that this whole world or, or, you know, especially in the United States, I think we're still really figuring out like, how do we build this? And some institutions I do believe are starting to really put it at the core of like their strategic plans and embedding it into their employee handbooks, establishing consistent meetings that will happen and not just meetings to talk, but meetings to actually develop some kind of action so that it starts to become a longevity type of thing, not just, oh, we're doing it this year. So I do believe that there is work happening right now. And this is very new. So I mean, again, I think that we have to pride ourselves on even being here and present and paying attention to this webinar or any other activities you're doing that represent DEI, DEIJ. And then it also brings me back to that moment, you know, was I supposed to have an educational moment with the person when, when, when they said, oh, what is DEI? Was that my moment to jump in, you know, as a black person? Like, yeah, well, let me educate you really quick. Or, you know, again, bringing it back to myself at the same time, you know, I, I have to digest my own emotions for this as well. Um, and when we think diversity, you know, I am a woman and we think of that as well. And when we think of LGBTQ, you know, I don't identify um, for LGBTQ. So I think that that's a whole nother um, voice that hopefully can come to this type of table and be present. Um, and, and if there are conversations around that, maybe that's something that can happen, whether in the chat or the next phase. So things like this, the Watershed Congress, this is putting it into action consistently each year, real building on this. So one of those things is really thinking in regards to um, the time it takes and it costs money. Like, I don't think anybody really says it, but it costs money. And I think that people of color, you know, when we're asked to be part of different boards or we're asked to come in and present, or we're asked to be present at certain things where there isn't a voice of color. I think we have to think about that. You know, it's not to say, it's in a, in a poor light or something like that, but it does. Our time is valuable, um, just like everybody else's, but we're also saying we want your time 
to um, share your emotional journey in this because it is emotional for us because we have been kind of at that other end of this. So it costs money, there's time, and then also there's transitions in staff constantly. You know, one in the environmental world, it's one we're short staffed, <laughs> and then we have transitions in staff. So it's hard to keep a continuum, as Joey was saying as well. So those are just some of those hardships that we have to figure out a way to work through. And they all take some kind of time. You know, you might not be able to handle them all at once. It might just be building on different small pieces so that one day, you know, whether it be, you know, a year from now, five years from now, you have it embedded in your, in your systems, you know, and no, I don't think anybody really has the right answer right now. No, thank you both. Uh, I think, and if I may interject, I'm breaking facilitator rules at this point, but it's all good. There's no rules, right? Uh, I think the, I think one of the most important things to remember is intentionality and language, right? Um, and I think when I look at this question, really talking about how do we, uh, you know, set these boundary or how do we, you know, alleviate some of this, you know, the weight off of our shoulders, I think is remembering and reminding folks that you talk from your experience um, and not from the experience of everybody and the communities that you represent, right? So you talk about, you know, me as a male Latino who lives in what many people would identify as an urban neighborhood. Those would be my experiences. Now, would there be people like me that lives here? Yes. But would their, would their, will their experiences be exactly the same as mine? Not exactly, right? So just remembering that you have the, the, Ability to set that boundary by reminding folks that you speak on your experiences and you you use language that highlights your perspective and your role. Um, and I think that would kind of help with some of those things. So you you know, next step is action, right? The conversation can go on for hours and hours, but we want to really think about what are some of the actionable things? What are some things that we can all put in play individually, um, collectively uh, as a community to move forward, right? Uh, so we had another question that came in that talked about your experience uh, and where, you know, what are some of the most meaningful actions uh, that, you know, your organization has taken to, to can take to diversify networks that you're into um, and in turn, hopefully uh, influence and benefit the community that you all interact with. Can you repeat like just a tiny bit of the ending? I want to make sure I heard. Sure, no, for sure. Thing. Uh, yeah, so talking about your experience and what has been the most meaningful actions that your organization or you yourselves have taken or seen that really helps to diver diversify the networks that you associate with. Um, and then the, the two second part to that can talk about, and you know, how does that essentially uh, benefit, you know, some of the conservation work that you do or that comes from it? Um, one of the things that launched this past year that Let's Go Outdoors was part of was an initiative. And some of you may be part of them, a community of practice. And I didn't know what a community of practice was when we got invited. It was um, four organizations and it was working in the Southeast region and bringing together educators from environmental ed, informal ed, schools. So it was really bringing together just a really diverse group of individuals. And I have to say that it wasn't focused on diversity per se, but it was trying to work to build in a way to look at informal science, inquiry-based science. However, the group help me like establish a, a new network. And I think that if we start to think about communities of practice, maybe in a way of DEIJ, and I believe that they are out there, so don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not part of one that's specifically fo focused on that. But I think that that is something that is, is spurring up these communities of practice that could actually make, make some really strong networks and movement in this world. So I, I want to say that that's one that's been really meaningful to me in regards to having a, a guiding principle, I should say. So that's one. And then I think one of the other things, you know, every day just showing up, I mean, 
the work that we're doing is not easy. I mean, we are bringing people of color outdoors when we know one, you know, in, in history, we, we, we have some, some very, you know, <laughs> different reasonings, cultural, historical, whatever, of, of getting out there. Um, but also there is many individuals that are of color that love and engage in the outdoors. And, you know, me, poor Louis, Joey, we're, we're all in that. So looking at it from those two perspectives, but showing up, um, speaking out, being willing to participate when we can. So I think that that's one of the biggest pieces as well to, to making actionable steps and sticking with it. Because some days it is tough. It's like, oh man, you don't want to go. Why not? You know, <laughs> so, so I think that, you know, <laughs> when people question it, being able to say, okay, you know, come up with some kind of reasoning that supports why you're doing this. So anyway, those are my thoughts in regards to actions. That's great. And so if I could just, you know, pick a few highlights or keywords that come to mind when I hear you speak, Tarsha, are uh, really the idea of collaboration or allyship, right? And thinking about how you can, you know, find like-minded, like interested individuals uh, that, that can help you navigate questions and experiences and kind of moving forward um, and, you know, accountability to, to continue the work and continue the, the, the progress. So, oh, Louis, did you have anything to add? Um, I, I do. Um, so um, I, I liked, I, I try to connect some of the work with current events because um, we may not be aware of this, but the things that we're exposed to on social media or on the news really has sometimes an unconscious effect on how we view certain things. Um, so I try to connect the two a little bit as we go along. Um, so one of the things, uh, I, one of the best practices is to really understand that DEIJ is not, um, it's not like a, a, a stereotype um, that we've historically seen about, uh, let's say, affirmative action, right? That we're doing someone a favor. It's not doing. It's not a favor to someone of in, having them be included. Uh, kind of like it's like we're a club and we're let, letting someone in, right? It, it's 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 much deeper than that. It, it's something that has to do with 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 ethics, right? And now, if if you see, uh, and I always connect to the, like the hashtags, you know, we see all these things, uh, the uh, social, quote unquote, social justice warriors, as if that's like a negative thing, right? Or now we're seeing the use of terms like woke, uh, which is, you know, a reference to being awake or aware, and apparently that's a bad thing, right? Um, and so, you know, I really wanna, want folks to really understand that there, this is, for many individuals, a lot of these efforts stem, uh, stem and connect with life and death situations, traumatic experiences. Um, it, it's not just you know being able to sit in a room with other folks. Um, and so if we look at this from a lens of just human feelings and experiences, and I think that's something that we can all relate to no matter what our backgrounds are um, or how we identify, it helps make the work a lot easier. Um, and also the fact that <clears throat> it's self-reflection, both personally and organizationally. So we make so much, we make such a huge emphasis on, oh, we, we have to do, we do program development, we do program assessments, we do evaluations, we do monitoring. monitoring. We have metrics for a million different things in order to drive performance. So why should this not be any different, right? This should be a part of how we can improve both personally and organizationally. However that looks like for your organization or your community, because DEIJ will look very different depending on where you are and who you're working with. Um, you know, that, as mentioned before, there's not like one solution for everyone. Um, and then lastly, um, you know, there is an importance of having um, what can be called either champions or allies, right? And, and, and that also can be a little tricky 
Um, but the reason why having allies within the white community is that these conversations not only need to happen with each other, but it also needs to happen amongst ourselves. And um, you know, there are often times where that piece ends up being missing. Um, and so one way to, that an organization or a network or an association can apply that is not having all the burden on one set group of people. If the folks, the members, the employees, the staff, the, those who are being served can see that an executive director, a board chair is leading this conversation and saying, this is important to us here are the steps that we're going to make towards this, then there is more trust and, and there is a sense of buy-in. Um, but if the conversations are happening in a very micro um, uh, manner, then you know, we're not trusting whether or not it's really gonna go somewhere. You know? um, so those are some of the best practices that I've seen really uh, generate um, success in different organizations and networks. That's great. You actually touched on one of the questions unintentionally, so that actually helps out. And the idea is, uh, you know, seeing change and, you know, have you noticed any of the changes happening um, that were made effective? Um, and then if anything, should there be a vision of what success looks like? And I think it's important to recognize that that looks different for everybody, right? And so progress and success for your organization is going to be depending on who your 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 stakeholders and your communities uh, that you're in. Um, and so, so you did talk a little bit about that, Louis. So I thank you for that. Um, we have a couple other questions, and it's hard to believe that we have just about 15 minutes left. Uh, so we're going to jump right into some of these questions. But before I ask or ask the next one, I do want to remind the 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 members who are watching that. Uh, we are gonna have a little bit more to talk about right after the session. So there is going to be uh, a discussion session that breaks out uh, for another half an hour after these. So you'll wanna look out in the chat for the links for those uh, closer to the end, the wrap up time. So uh, just wanted to put that little nugget of reminder in there. But moving back to the questions, uh, there's a question here that talks about, do you think it's important for an organization to educate its leaders and staff about the origin uh, of the lack of DEIJ, um, or do you know? Do we just move forward from where we are today to improve it? I'm going to just say that is a really good question. Um, I think that you can only work with people that are open to it. You know, like you can can talk to your blue in the face, right? I got kids. So I mean, again, if they don't agree or they don't see my way, if you they can't have that candy, they're just gonna be really upset. And it's the same way. I mean, we're all people, right? We're all, we're, we're, so it's more like you can talk and talk and talk. And if somebody just isn't interested, you, I think you have to either say, all right, leadership isn't, isn't kind of hearing. Is there anybody else, you know, as poor Louis was saying, you know, find allies, you know, within your organization as well, because sometimes it could be scary. You know, I, I can't speak for how it is as a white person. And, and, you know, if you know, you might be working with somebody that doesn't feel the same way, you know, I don't know, but at the same time, if they're not feeling it, then maybe there's other people that you can connect with that are in the organization that are interested. And then you kind of start to form this, I sound like some secret agent, like a secret agent kind of group. And then, you know, you look for other organizations. And like I said, I think that community of practice idea and that model can work because as you find others at other organizations, then you start to build out something that's just bigger than just one organization. It's we're all taking this on. So it becomes visualized as a team. So, so, you know, again, I, I think it can come from two perspectives. If you have an, a willing board that's willing to listen, then great. But you could take years. And I think it was mentioned, maybe Joey mentioned it, you know, it could take years sometimes. And, and you don't want to waste so much of your precious time talking and talking and talking. It's more like, you know, you kind of not just move on in a, in a poor manner, you know, keep it professional, of course, but it's just a matter of looking at it from the perspective of find somebody else and maybe that person can get to the other person because maybe people talk differently to one another, which does happen. So that would be my answer, my thought. 
If I can add, that's great, Tarsha. If I can add, there was a comment that came through, um, and I think it goes hand in hand with this as well. Uh, and it says that, you know, DEI training, education, awareness, whatever we want to call it, right? Uh, it's a really, it, it's something that should probably occur much earlier uh, that, you know, before most people start, you know, if, if it's possible before, at, a year, at a younger age, if, um, if this awareness, training, education, whatever we want to call it, uh, starts much, you know, starts before anyone's adult or professional life. Um, this person said, it's a, if it's a cultural thing, it's probably more impactful to, to start at a much earlier age uh, and start to mold some of the mindsets in this, in this front. So uh, I did wanted to add that. And I thought that was a good time to do you know, the question that we have on the table right now. Um, Hallelujah, I'll pass it to you. Yeah, I, I, I definitely am a, a huge advocate of being a life learner. I, I think professionally and, and personally, you know, uh, always wanting to learn and self-reflect and self-improve is just a fundamental uh, value that, uh, you know, I think would benefit us from any walk of life. Um, so if we, you know, take, if we adapt that mindset to this, um, I think it really gives us, you know, uh, a, a, a different perspective. Um, and so the education piece of what that could look like organizationally, um, I, I would say included on in your onboarding, you know, when you're hiring folks, is, it's, it's part of day one. Um, uh, also having folks participate in both the conversations and the workshops and, and the trainings um, as professional development. Um, not as a, a special project. Um, so, and, and this also would, uh, I've also seen it included as part of the trainings that are needed in order to have supervisory roles. So as you work with different staff and, 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 and um, different uh, departments, you're gonna see there's different cultures. Um, and, and, and not even just, um, you know, uh, from the perspective of race, ethnicity, or gender identity, um, there's different cultures departmentally, there's different cultures. So um, I, I think, that, you know, there's some, sometimes I think we lose sight in how the root of this, there, there's, there, there are these core um, uh, 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 understandings that we use every day in our work and I just want to normalize that because this could be completely applied to that. And, and, it, and it seems less intimidating or less scary to really uh, try to implement this. Um, as Tarsha mentioned, will everyone buy into it? Uh, no. Um, and I think in some cases, you know, there are cases where, where that's fine. Not everyone has to agree in this. I think depending on the extent of the disagreement, and especially if the organization is trying to make this cultural change, then there may be some tough decisions about staffing, whether whether or not individuals will remain in their roles or not, right? Um, but I think that um, education is key, and and everyone has to be participating in that. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna toss out our last one for this evening. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up with this last question. And it's really, and then you know, it's it's a question that that is targeted to help avoid unintentional microaggressions, in a sense. And it's really just talking about what can be some nuggets of knowledge or tips, actionable items that that's recommended for white people to do on a small and interpersonal scale uh, to help other communities feel engaged, welcome, things like that. Especially and, and intentional when we, when it's tied in when interacting outside, so that could be you know bringing folks to you know the outdoor open spaces or whatever the case may be or anything externally. How do we you know what are some tips or pointers, nuggets of knowledge is what I love to say, uh, for individuals. Um, there's there's one example and and hopefully this helps. I'm not sure if it directly answers the question. However, there was an, there, a while back, this was many years when we were first starting out and we were at a school and across the street from the school, there was a garden. 
and an organization was helping with that garden. The organization was white led, but the community was not as welcoming. It was a black community. And so I, I asked her, I said, oh, well, how about we go through the community together? And, and we can talk to the individuals and we can say that, you know, um, it's something that we're looking to do and, and, and we're just gonna support one another. I kind of was offering kind of a face that could identify with the community, even though her organization was operating the garden. So, but I would have to say her response and maybe she wasn't hearing me. And sometimes I think that non-people of color, we could say white people, need to sometimes take a moment to listen to sometimes a black voice or a person of color's voice because sometimes we don't speak in the same manner or back to my whole sociology background, you know, we're used to communicating with those that look like us and we speak the same language. So we understand those that look like us a little better than those that maybe don't. So I don't know if maybe that could have been um, something that we weren't communicating on the same because I was trying to say, let's walk around together so maybe they'll be more accepting of you and want to come to your garden. Even though I don't know the community either as well, but I know that they might be more willing if we go out there as a team. So I would say that's one thing to, to, to see if you can partner with somebody that looks like the community or looks like, um, you know, and if you can't, because we know that in every community it's not easy, you know? So it's more like, I think that a way to just feel welcoming is sometimes to, and it doesn't have to be just your, your face out there, send out, you know, or go door to door, do some flyers or something like that, recognizing your organization is going to be doing something. I think that we've lost that, that sense of community sometimes as well. Uh, that door to door, handing out flyers, um, we're losing that to email. <laughs> so. That's one thing I would say. Yeah, yeah. with microaggressions, um, man, that's a really sore point. The reason why I say that is because um, you can actually experience trauma from long-term microaggressions. And one of the reasons why you can develop trauma as a result of it is because the microaggressions can be so subtle that everyone thinks you're crazy when you try to bring it up. And then if you feel frustrated that you're not being heard, then you're showing your emotions, uh, then there's a high chance that you could be labeled as a troubled employee or staff, uh, someone who is, you know, uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank of the word, but like, let's say combative, right? And now there's like a supervisor or supervisee conflict or something to that nature. Um, or, or uh, the statement of, of well, they're not, be, they're not being a team player, right? Um, and so I just, I, when it comes to microaggressions, I really, I think it's important to understand, and I mentioned before about social norms. So social norms plays a big role on, on a couple different things. One is, uh, so let's say being a team player, what being a team player looks like doesn't look the same in every single environment. Um, so I think there are standards that are set in place that are culturally informed and not welcoming to anyone who is outside of that culture. One example of that is what is defined as professional. So professional includes how we dress, how we manage our hair, our hygiene, uh, what types of, you know, sense we use, um, how we speak, how we communicate, tones of voice. All of these things are completely different for so many different people, uh, but somehow in certain work environments, um, it's it's supposed to be all the same, right? And so, uh, you know, that's another pitfall of microaggressions. I mean, I've even had someone like they, you know, we were talk, they were talking about like music, and uh, you know, we were uh, just trying to like break some ice, and they're like, oh, hold week, because I'm Latino, they're like. Uh, you know, oh, you must love reggaeton. Well, I mean, by chance, actually, I do love reggaeton, but <laughs> I'm not going to deny that. Um, but I actually have, I, I listen to country music. I've line danced. I mean, I probably wouldn't show a video of myself doing it because I'm terrible, but 
like I dig it. Like it's cool, you know. Um, so it's like someone who's who's born and raised from the Bronx, line dancing. Yeah, it's probably not something you normally would see, <laughs> but but so it, it's just like we make assumptions oftentimes, you know. And and I think if we were just to open ourselves up, um, you know, some of those microaggressions, uh, you know, would lessen. And, and the key goal is not to completely eliminate microaggressions because honestly, it's part of human nature, right? Um, it's not possible. But what is possible is to create a space where we can uh, uh, talk about those microaggressions and have us uh, understand that that self-awareness is part of the, our professional development in whatever we're doing so that we can then take ownership of those unintentional microaggressions and apologize or say, oh, I wasn't aware of that and have those talks, we can talk them out and we can move forward together, right? And that's how everyone learns. But if we're afraid of having these difficult conversations or if uh, senior management or executives are afraid that if we try to implement, implement uh, you know, DEIJ, that it's gonna create a, 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 a divide in our organization. So uh, let's not go there. Um, then, you know, things won't change. But um, I definitely wanna highlight that diversity, equity in, in, in school of thought and gender identity and race, ethnicity, faith, those are strengths and it will make our organizations that much more rich in our skill sets, in the, our ability to perform our jobs, and our ability to enhance and improve just as we all want to professionally and within our fields and our sciences. Um, so I really encourage everyone to take a moment and reflect internally and really see how that can connect to your work on, on the day to day. Awesome. Holui, Tarsha. I can't thank you enough for, for really being here and bringing just your experiences and sharing your, your, your expertise and your knowledge to the table. Um, so thank you, sincerely, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm afraid it's time to wrap up our session, uh, but like I said, I can't thank our speakers enough for once again, taking their time to just share you know, their stories with us during this weekend, during this session.